I would like to take this time to introduce to you our panelists. Next to me is Rohan de Soya. He is the chairman of the Supplement Foundation. We have Shari de Silva. She is the chief curator of the Jeffrey Bawa Trust. And we have Malga Talwata, the chair of the board of trustees for the George Keat Foundation. This talk is to discuss the crucial point of what art and cultural institutions do within Sri Lanka. All of these institutions are legacy institutions of people who have made a huge effect in the art sphere for Sri Lanka. And with that, I would like Rohan to begin. Thank you, Noor. I don't mind if I read it read out. No. Uh, good evening, ladies. Uh, good evening, fellow art lovers. What the Sapuman Foundation does is to maintain a gallery of artworks collected and displayed by the founder, Harry Peerless, in the house he lived in. He was a secretary of the 43 group, and most of these were bought directly by him from the artists, and many more from an auction of Lionel Wendt's effects after he passed on. In 1974, he felt that he should establish something of a more permanent nature so that the public could view good art and be enriched thereby. Margaret Gunaratna, an English woman who was a librarian at the American Center, said, Harry, in his understated yet determined way, was convinced that the advantages he had inherited, received, and gained must be shared with a wider range of people. It was a responsibility that made him restless. In such thinking, the Sapuman Foundation took firm and adventurous road. That was Margaret Gunratna's, those are her words. So he formed the Sapuman Foundation with two close friends, Dr. Christopher Raffer and Dr. Arthur Virukun as trustees. We maintain it as it was, so that visitors and researchers can savor its simple and serene ambience. The good art of the 43 group, the first modern art movement in Sri Lanka, uh, use our reference library if they wish, and leave refreshed and enriched by the experience. As all meetings of the 43 group took place here after 1945, it has a historical connection with the group and could be called a heritage building. We now give space to teachers of arts and crafts to hold classes and impart their skills to young and old. We also hold exhibitions for artists who approach us to do so. At inception, few of these activities took place. As time went on, a lady art teacher began uh, holding art classes for children and a sculptor commenced classes for adults after our founder passed on in 1988, and the premises occupied by the driver and the garage became vacant. They continued their much appreciated activities for over 20 years. With time, our lady art teacher, teacher passed on and our sculptor retired. We were then fortunate to find a lady craft teacher and a young sculptor teacher who we trust will be with us for some time. Meanwhile, the executor of a Sri Lankan lady artist who wished to have some of her artworks displayed approached the board. We agreed that he could build a suitable gallery and asked for a small apartment above so we could rent it out and get, get an income. He agreed with some conditions. We believe, as did the 43 group, that by advancing the cause of art by this and other means, we sow the seeds of a better life for all. We follow the vision of our foremost philosopher of the 20th century, Anand Kumar Sami, that nations are made by artists and poets, not by traders and politicians. Art contains within itself the deepest principles of life, the truest guide to the greatest art, the art of living. We also try to follow our founder's vision that the artist is not a special kind of man, but that every man or woman was or could become a special kind of artist. Good work with the painting, making pottery, food, gardening, or anything else was a love affair between the work, the, the, the artist and his production, done with feeling. 
he felt that the work of the 43 group reflected this concept. Our mission is to try and impart these principles to those who visit us. We give space for art and literature connected meetings, talks and exhibitions. Exhibitions are now confined to the rear portion of the house on what we call false walls that we devise to avoid removing the paintings. In 2014, our 40th anniversary, a quartet led by Lakshman Joseph Disaram gave a recital in our main hall. His mother Sita had done a bust of Harry Peavis and he used to accompany her when she was making it, so had much affection for the place. About five years ago, we found that the building was deteriorating because it's actually three workers' cottages made into one house. Thus had to extensively renovate the roof and walls, keeping the ambience unchanged. And so we, so we carry on with our small team to keep intact and perpetuate what Ellen Disnaika described as a place where timeless gentility still clings. Uh, she said it's uh, very rare in the West and, uh, and it's evanescent even here. So she was quite thrilled with the place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rohan. I just want to say that today I took the time to view everything with Rohan at the Supplemal Foundation. And it is one of the most exquisite places where it shows the 43 groups works. And I, I'm sure all of you have either been there, but if you haven't, please go take a look. And just, yeah, I was floored and continue to be floored by what it is. So thank you so much for everything that you do for the Supplemal Foundation. Thank you, Noah. You're welcome. Thank and you. I think. Sorry. Ah. <laughs> yeah, Apologies. Now, Shayari will speak about the Jeffrey Bawa Trust. Thank you so much, Shayari. And also, Shayari and the Jeffrey Bawa Trust happen to be grant partners of Art South Asia Project 2, and we're very happy to be partnering with them. Over to you. Thank you, Noor. And thank you um, to you and all the collaborators, Saskia, Kala. Um, I'm so glad to see these events happening. They're so necessary. Um, I think we maybe, as institutions, wanted to have a conversation like this for some time. Uh, so it's great that we get to do it. Um, so the Jeffrey Bauer Trust was, is a nonprofit public trust that was established in 1982 by the late architect. And um, our mission is to further the fields of art, architecture, and ecological and environmental sciences. And I think it's quite um, striking that even though it bears the name of Jeffrey Bauer, uh, there's actually nothing in our mandate that outlines preserving his, his legacy. Um, and also, as early as 1982, that he included the ecological and environmental sciences and really understood how inseparable all these disciplines were um, is really quite amazing. Um, and here you see the architect. Uh, so when he passed in 2003, the trust uh, inherited four properties um, and his estate. And uh, quite interestingly, the, the 20 years preceding his death, the trust has, I think, in its bones this legacy of care. It was also a way for him to enable legally uh, for his closest friends, including Christopher Ruffell. And um, actually, Christopher Ruffell was not one of the original trustees, but was an advisor, um, to, uh, to be able to take care of him, to be able to take care of uh, the garden. And following his death, uh, the trust looks after these four properties, which include number 11, also four um, workers' cottages that were owned by Harry Pierce and uh, bought by Jeffrey in 1960, uh, Nunuganga, his garden, um, the, dis, uh, sorry, the gallery cafe, which was his office until, up until the mid-1980s, and then lastly, the Ina de Silva house, which I will return to. Um, and as you can see, even in these images, um, the buildings are densely populated with his collection. We also hold um, objects that uh, he collected, that he designed. And when I say he, I'm really talking about a collective because it was uh, the architecture practice, um, as well as uh, over 4,000 drawings 
uh, over 1,200 documents and over 1,000 books. And the reason all these numbers have pluses against them is that we're still in the process of cataloging and um, I believe this number will increase. Um, and what's quite amazing about the archives, for example, is the way they have this interplay, um, drawings that we hold for buildings that either we manage or own or are studying. And there's a very interesting story about the relationship between art and architecture when you look at these as a whole. Um, and of course, uh, having Prop, as you've already hinted at, uh, Rohan, there's an intense conservation requirement, which the Trust has been, I would say, one of the forerunners in, this, in the modern period. So we um, worked with the Rudruvi and Sharmini Deserum, the owners of the Deserum house, to restore this house, which we also now manage. And the way, I should say, the way the Trust funds itself primarily in this economy that has no state funding and very little support for the arts is by uh, the visits and stays at these four properties, then uh, come back into our maintenance, our programming. Um, and we also really believe that these buildings need to be lived in to, to survive. Um, and then the Ina de Silva House, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but it was an amazing um, effort for the trust to relocate it in 2010 when it uh, was facing demolition um, to a site that is now in adjacent to Lunoganga. And I think it was one of the boldest efforts that um, we've taken and definitely influences our um, sort of belief in the importance of finding creative ways to preserve uh, art and architecture. Um, and here you see it as it stands at uh, Lunganga today. Um, and then we also host uh, a series of curatorial programs. This was really kick-started in 2018 um, when I was hired very shortly afterwards. Um, my colleagues, we, we formed this very small curatorial team of four and used Bawa's birth centenary as an occasion to um, take these holdings and really look at our mandate, which is about sharing it for the public, about scholarship, um, about access, conservation. And this program was um, a one-year program. Because of COVID, it became a two-year program. But it was a whole uh, slew of talks, tours, events, exhibitions that were in many ways first steps delving into these collections, these places. And that has continued over the last five years, even under quite intense um, conditions. Uh, out of the Bar 100, the major contemporary program was uh, these five site-specific um, installations called The Gift at Lunukanga, building on the tradition of the garden to have artists make work, respond to the place, and by doing so, shift our own perception and Constant, it's a constant relooking that we're doing. Um, thank you, Sulakshi. And uh, here you can see Kengo Kuma, who had a pavilion. We always work with artists and architects. Um, Dominic Sansoni, who's been photographing the garden since he was 17. So it was amazing to have him return and make this very beautiful uh, body of work. Um, we also did an exhibition in 2022 that was the first time we really focused on the archives and really tried to make it something that we collectively as a community can engage with. And um, because it was a first time, we spent a lot of time thinking about how do you make architectural drawings accessible. We did daily and sometimes more than once a day tours. We really tried to make the most of having these materials on view. Um, we published a companion publication. The Trust also has its own imprint, but with this one we worked with Las Mueller so that we could have wider distribution. Um, and we have an ongoing oral histories program. Um, we are also taking very much to heart, and I, um, I have an amazing group of colleagues who are here, I think. Um, 
in looking at Jeffrey's practice, not only as him or his colleagues, but looking at the time. So uh, in 2022, we began a program selecting five key architects from that post-colonial, immediately post-colonial period. Um, and initially, we, and that year, 2022, was so um, eventful, but we managed to do this on a really shoestring budget where we still were able to, I think, do some participatory programs, including a wiki editathon, an open house, um, and uh, a project called Model Ideas, where we worked with artists to make and interpret uh, these practices. And uh, just the last thing I would say is that our ongoing program, which we launched last year in celebration of Lunu Ganga's 75th anniversary, was really an effort to look back at the garden and try and understand our collection is including, for example, trees and living components, um, but also looking a lot closer at this relationship between ecology and the environment. And so um, we also have as part of this program, and you can all go see it, I hope you will, um, uh, an installation by Rina Kalat, uh, Firi Rahman, and um, my colleague Tini has curated a program looking at the garden through a queer lens. And later this year, we'll have architect Sumaya Valley uh, install a pavilion. So that's a very quick overview. I mean, that was wonderful. Thank you so much, Shayari. Again, had the pleasure to visit the Jeffrey Bawa, number 11 house. Have obviously been to Gallery Cafe as well and excited to see the other two spaces and even more. And again, this is actually just for the audience that's gonna watch this later online, but must visit venues, all of them. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. Over to you, Malika. Hi, everyone. Uh, so the George Keat, Foundation was actually founded in 1988 by some of his close friends, uh, headed by Sita and Cedric de Silva, uh, who wanted to firstly maintain his legacy as an artist. Uh, in 1990, it became an approved charity. And some of the first things they did was actually to have exhibitions of George Kitt, because George Kitt was alive when we started. Uh, the other thing that they really were keen on was to ensure that Sri Lanka still is very much 
in the interest of the English speaking community. Uh, so we want to uh, go beyond that. So these are some of the programs that we have done. And we have also maintained the Golden Vihara Temple, uh, which contains church kids find as well in my local camp. Uh, we had a restoration done in 1990 with the help of uh, the Indian High Commission. And right now, even in recent times, we've been able to help them support the conflict. So these are some of the programs that we have done in the past and are ongoing. Thank you so much, Malika. That was great. Again, Another place I have had the pleasure of visiting on this trip, and it was just wonderful to see how everything is preserved of George Keats, and just thank you to all three of you for all the work that you do for the foundations and institutions that you work for, because truly it is very important for the ecosystem and how it grows. So with that said, and now that I have physically seen all of the spaces as well, you all clearly function on very different levels in regards to how you maintain and work within your institutions. And would you be able to further explain that so that the audience can know a little bit more about the functionality? Yeah. Yes, I, I think um, we are relatively low key compared to <laughs> both the Jeffrey Bava Trust and the John Keyes Foundation. <laughs> we kind of uh, exist and keep the place going. And uh, we are not, we, we do give this, we do hold exhibitions. We've had a number of exhibitions uh, over the years uh, for, for artists who come and want to have exhibitions. Uh, we don't actively pursue these things, but if uh, we, we try and help wherever we can. So there it's, uh, our main collection is permanently on display, and that is, that is our main uh, focus. So a lot of students, especially from the Visual Arts University, but also from all over the place, Daphna, Batikolo, Mathura, and so on, they visit the foundation. Uh, so, and they see that kind of art. Uh, we are not so proactive, uh, you know, to, uh, of course we have art and craft classes. So that, that way, you know, that, that helps. But we are certainly not as active as the, the other two organizations. Uh, we are a much smaller team. Not yet. <laughs> That's well, what is it? Not uh, yet. Well, uh, I don't know whether we want to, <laughs> <laughs> because we are, we are also projecting a certain type of approach. Yes. A, a sort of a simple kind of approach. Uh, we don't necessarily want to do big things in in that sense, and uh, so so it's a it's a different approach. And as I said, we want to keep this uh, type of atmosphere where people can come and be refreshed. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Thank you, Rohan. Um, okay. I guess possibly one of the places that's unique to Malika and Rohan is that I'm in Bali. Um, our trustee is our voluntary, and all of our, in between these four projects, I'm developing this kind of there's a team, there's a payroll of over 50 people, which is huge, and we are very, very proud of also that in these last four years we have found a new goal. But yes, that's a significant commitment, and that, that is also, I think, the reason uh, the trust took all that time between Jeffrey's passing and launching the Pretoria program. Um, and it really is an ecosystem that you couldn't do it in one part. I know just one part in a video that I did our system, um, the main trustee, the main program, and then the main project that we have seen have known Jeffrey, they knew how the places were, um, the culture that was um, enormously, enormously privileged to have um, all the things of different experiences and skills. Um, I would say that we have, uh, so we mentioned Mr. Brown, but his daughter Sohania, who is the director of the executive director of Ben Plus, and we do benefit from her amazing experience in DC. Um, and as we, you know, there's of course a lot of architectural expertise in the trust as well, but from, in the perspective of uh, what vision arts and uh, or conservation perhaps. Uh, so I think the drive to get professionals and to train museum professionals in the country um, was part of that vision in 2018 to launch the Centenary Program. Mm -hmm. And I had worked on this previously. I lived for 10 years at the state and worked in museums uh, and archives, and that um, has been enormously beneficial. Um, but we also have, um, I know, a senior team that's been with 
students for five years and learning, I think I've been able to benefit from changing the learning aspects. Um, and that's something we're very, very committed to continuing as well. We get annual, uh, annual internships all, all year round um, because uh, you know, that we do need to have taking position to preserve the and make sure that we can understand this past using the our present and our future and I think so key to all of us is You have quite a lot of jobs open right now, correct? That you're taking We do. Yeah. <laughs> yes. If you want to go once to uh, be an assistant curator or production manager, we really do try and have that it's a small team of ten we can join the but <laughs> so I think that's an important point she touched on. So uh, that is a big place we need to be And uh, to be totally honest, I think uh, the part of us should be a benchmark for the other foundations in Sri Lanka of uh, how well they've done, how well they manage the trust. And importantly, it uh, helps the whole ecosystem. I mean, uh, the part of us having visitors at Gurudana means uh, you know, it's helping the arts because Thank you so much to everyone for answering that question. Um, the next question I have is about public engagement and what type of people you're looking to. Like Sharari just said, she is looking for more people to join her team. What, how are you engaging with the public and how are you also interacting with people to get them engaged with your mission of your institution and how it's functioning? Uh, we, we are not uh, so active in that, on that side. Um, we think of ourselves more like a, say, like a forest <laughs> where people come and they, they feel quite peaceful or happy and uh, they, they, they get something out of that kind of experience. So that, that is, of course, at the moment, the way I'm running it. But of course, maybe future trustees may take a different point of view. Uh, but I, I am also interested in ecology, but I tend to let things be as they are rather than trying to uh, evolve and so on because that has its own big falls also. Uh, but we have no objection. I mean, not only the other day, somebody approached her and said, can we have a butterfly garden here? Yeah. So I said, well, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> they, they will do the work, you know, and we'll have a butterfly garden. They, they know what to plant. So, <laughs> so we are open to suggestions and we are open to collaborations where, the, where there's a sort of a synergy between the different missions. And as far well, as the public is concerned, will they come and, as I say, it's like a forest, you, you wander around. Uh, it's a serene kind, it's a nice kind of ambience. Uh, and uh, we give to the public in that way.
then we, in five years later, with the two women of our program, we are able to, I think, have a little bit more nuance um, that has an amazing appetite on these three broad levels uh, to engage with this material. So with that, we've been really thinking about access. As Mark has said, um, I think that institutions in uh, Sri Lanka are really at the forefront of saying things have to be trilingual, legally they have to be trilingual, but also in terms of making them approachable. Um, so, you know, we do work across all three languages, but also we've been thinking a lot about um, um, I'm blanking on the word, but, um, you know, what can we do beyond language, access beyond language, and thinking about Jeffrey, who in the last five years of his life was non vocal and non mobile, and we, we tend to always focus on the parts of history where everyone is perfectly able, but not one of us will ever be that way. And so, and the garden is such an amazing place to actually approach these conversations. So, in our upcoming two years, access is going to be really at the core of what we're trying to uncover, but across language, across mobility, across transport in Sri Lanka, we are asking a student to come to Yulina and speak a bit, but then that's not a bit different. So, we are, um, Akeem and I are always thinking, how do we kind of um, take a grounded approach to what access means with these five programs? Thank you. It's not, but I can tell you it's not. <laughs> Thank you so much, that's great. Now my question is more 
focused on each one of you in your roles in what you're doing. Can you explain or tell us a bit more about certain key developments and changes you've made at each one of the institutions you work at that have helped the institution flourish even further? Uh, yes. I, I was connected with the, uh, Harry Pires, who found that this is actually my grand uncle. So there's a sort of a family connection, but the, I don't think that's why he asked me to be a trustee. <laughs> it was more the fact that I was also a photographer and I could photograph the paintings and make sort of simple booklets to be taken around that kind of thing. Uh, initially, I, I was abroad for a long time and I drove overland and came here and we used to ask us for, for lunch and tea and things like that. And uh, so as we talked, I realized, you know, that some of his ideas and mine were resonated. And so one day he asked me to be a trustee, and that's how I became a trustee. And uh, so my main contribution would have been uh, with uh, Neville Veer Ratna, we published a book called the Sapumar Foundation Collection, mm -hmm. a select catalog. Mm -hmm. Neville did all the writing and editing, and I took, I photographed the entire collection and oh, inventorized wow. it and measured the paintings. That was, as uh, Malako was saying, <laughs> it had to be done by, by, by me, really. So yeah. you did all the cataloging of yes. each individual artwork that went into the publication and yes. did the photography for it? Yeah, no, I did the entire collection. And maybe he was living in Australia. So I then sent it to him. <laughs> and what happened is he was here on a visit and he offered to do the, the writing and the editing and the layout free of charge. Mm -hmm. He said, if you give me seven books, that's enough. So, but only we had to find a photographer. <laughs> so, I was a photographer and a trustee. So, I said, okay, I'll take you up on that. I'll do all the photographs in return for seven books. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's how that was done. Amazing. And um, it was published in 2010. Mm -hmm. So, 2008 and 9, uh, I photographed, I mean, I did give my sort of time off from other things. So um, that was one contribution. Then in the meantime when we were doing that, we were gifted a whole lot of paintings mm -hmm. by, by last will, uh, by two close friends of Harry's. Mm -hmm. So then I thought, well, now these have not come into our original book. So I, I did a second book mm -hmm. called the supplement to the supplement collection, mm -hmm. which I think you've seen or you have. Yes. So I have both books, have don't, both yeah, books. I have both. Right. <laughs> and whoever so, doesn't, go get them, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, then I've also given uh, PowerPoints presentations to the National Trust on the Pottery Group, to the Institute of Art, Architecture and Design in Jaffna on the Sapumai Foundation, and uh, another one to the Lionel Wendt, Lionel Wendt Memorial Trust near the Lionel Wendt, uh, which was titled Lionel Wendt, Nucleus of the 43 Group. And also I've given four talks to Columbus Scope over the years. Then uh, in 2018 and 19, I supervised the extensive renovation of the roofs and walls because the building is really workman's cottages and they were not very well built. And we discovered that the rafters were rotting and the, the sheets were breaking and so on. So we took it all apart and then restored, you know, we had to replace half the rafters. Mm -hmm. The old rafters were actually in better condition than the newer ones. And so anyway, that was done. And we devised what we think or hope is, is a good way of controlling termites. Only time will tell whether we were right or not. <laughs> <laughs> but so far, I mean, uh, so far it has been reasonably successful. Uh, what else have I done? Yeah, then uh, I also introduced a simple way of keeping updated accounts. And uh, we brought out spiral bound copies of the, you know, the Sakumar Foundation, the main catalog sold out. Mm -hmm. So reprinting it is extremely expensive and the sales are also quite slow. Mm -hmm. So we devised a way of photocopy, color photocopies in spiral bound form which are quite acceptable mm -hmm. for researchers, mm -hmm. people like that. So mm -hmm. that, that is 
uh, and then we also introduced the taking of credit card facilities, mm -hmm. which was lacking up to then. Mm. So those are some of the contributions that I, I have made. Yeah. And we are still quite a small team, but we, we might need to grow a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so time will tell. <laughs> There's always room for growth, but it's yeah. amazing that in your position you have been able to develop so much educational and development practices now for the entire Sapuma Foundation. So wonderful. Jerry. Um, I guess I kind of hesitate to say about the Sapuma Foundation because it's so much as a collective, but I think it's very nice if I did something. Take credit. No. <laughs> So this journey has been quite exciting, but it's definitely a collective. I would take uh, many personal uh, gratitude for that. You're all too nice. <laughs> anyway, but no, thank you so much for sharing all of that. And of course, everyone should work collectively in this piece.
Um, my last question for you, and then we're going to open it up to the audience, is that have you worked collaboratively together in your institutions? And would you work collaboratively together? And how would you collaborate? Just brainstorming, that's all. <laughs> um, no, I don't think we have worked collaboratively <laughs> up to now. <laughs> but I've been nothing to prevent it. Um, so, I mean, uh, quite how we are going to collaborate is a different matter because all are slightly different aims. So, but there, there may be ways. I'm, I'm sure I could learn a lot, or our trustees also could learn a lot from the way that uh, Shairi and Malika, particularly Shairi, has uh, grown the Bhava Trust, Shairi and the trustees. So, we also have trustees, but all of, I mean, all of us are doing other things. And it's, uh, so, we are not, uh, we are all, uh, nobody's paid. So, uh, so for that reason, it's difficult, you know, to, I, I tend to have done most of the work myself because I mean, either I had to do it or just let it slide. But uh, we could collaborate yeah, on those lines. Uh, we could learn a lot from you and from Malika also. So that's basically, uh, you know, something for the future. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I know we had I think the women who talked to me about this talk. I wanted to do this talk on the soapbox. I think it's maybe the last talk. But um, our doors are open, and I think I think that things there's momentum. I mean, you you have to remember that the last four years have just been yeah. really tough, and I think you know every local institution has really taken a hit. Mm -hmm. But I. Actually, yeah, I do need to give credit to Shayari for this because we were talking about a discussion and then this is how it evolved. And I have to say, it's been amazing listening to all of you. So thank you so much for all the insight, everything that you've given us. Hopefully, you know, next time we're all together, there'll be a collaboration we can talk about. Yeah, so at this time, can I give, does anyone have a question? I sadly can't see anyone, so I'm gonna have to pass this forward. <laughs>
no synergies with the liberal down here. But I'm very, very keen to see how you work with the, the, you know, the treasures uh, that are sort of not stolen and still remain in the dominant places.
going back to your question, I mean, uh, sorry, I hope I'm not taking too much time. You're good. I mean, when we needed to raise funds four months ago, uh, we actually didn't have any funds. And then I went and spoke to two CEOs and said, you know, is, it, is there any possibility to get support for the foundation? Then one of them said, you know, this year they're giving 100,000 books to school children whose parents can't afford Would you like to speak on We want to have a And the second one said, yeah. I think Rohan may want to say a few words on that. Yes, the, as I think I was mentioning at the event we had uh, at the Paradise Road Gallery, we tend to cut our uh, quotes according to the plot we have, as it were. And sometimes it, it works. I mean, we've had people coming to the Sapma who like the Sapma, and they have they realize that we are trying to restore paintings, and we've had people offering to fund them uh, without wanting any credit, which is somewhat unusual. But they say, we, we like the place, we like the paintings, and so we'd like to do something to help. So we have actually started on that. And they will restore a fair number of paintings, but they, they, they want to be anonymous which is unusual, but also very wonderful. Because they say we are doing it for the love of it, not in order to get credit or anything like that. So that is very unusual. And it shows you the true passion that this person yes. has, and that's, this, right. and that's the it's most important more thing. more than one person. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time no, they for... They have a particular attachment to the, in some way or the other to the supplement. <laughs> <laughs> having been there as children or whatever, <laughs> and, uh, or that their children went to art classes there. there there's that kind of connection. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Yeah. Um, I can't, of course, see anybody, but anyway. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I still we still can't, can't see you, life. so it's, yeah. So, but ask <laughs> That, that's, uh, in a way, a tricky question, because it's the Sapmaya Foundation has a lot of art. We have about 300 on display, three to 400, and plus another many drawings in storage. So <coughs> it's, it's quite a, a place which is quite airy. So the paintings are generally somewhere around 80 years, 90 years old, and there's uh, the attitude of conservation in the old days was a little different to what it is today. Mm -hmm. And so I think Harry Pierce used to ask his driver, he said, some paint is coming off there, can you <laughs> restore that? So and he restored it in some way or the other. But we, we know now that that is not the right way. Uh, so there is that question, problem, but also it's the, the, the setting is as important. It's a heritage house. Mm -hmm. The, it's got a certain kind of atmosphere, certain ambience. So we, if we are conditioned it, that, that we'd have to put in ceilings. Mm -hmm. And we'd have to close up the whole place, it'll lose its character. Mm. So uh, for us at the moment, the, that is as important as the artwork. It's not a monetary thing, the artworks might be more valuable than a house, but, <laughs> but it's the combination of the two. 
and we want to keep it that way. Hmm. As I say, it's, it's like a forest. We, uh, we want to keep it as a forest. We don't want to cut down trees and build things and so on. We want to keep things as they are as far as possible. Yeah. And, uh, but we are restored, we restored, I think, hopefully, the, the property. Mm -hmm. So now we are embarking on the second stage, which is restoring the yeah. artworks. And fortunately, as I said, there are people who are willing to support us without actually wanting any credit. And I think that's a good example mm -hmm. to set. And I saw the restorations today. They're very, very good. So kudos to whoever is doing that work. It's excellent. Um, I think oh, one more question, and then that will have to be the last one. I'm sorry.
of our institutions must do that. But uh, the scalability becomes an issue for small institutions, mainly because of funds. Sure. Yes. Um, maybe slightly contentious thing is that we actually work with a very small volunteer base and are very keen that all positions, including internships, are paid. And this is part of being accessible so that the role, if it's open, should be, if anyone should be able to do it. And balancing that also, I mean, it's not the kind of thing that is a volunteer, but, um, and we do with events and Docents who want to, but even then, we always pay at least a stipend for their transport and their needs. So that yeah. this work in the cultural sector is valued. It's not seen as a hobby or as you know a side hustle, but really as a sustainable career. Um, so that does also that they may want you to do, but I think it's important. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. mm -hmm. uh. Yeah, I'm in sort of two minds about this, but <laughs> in the sense that uh, I, one of my other projects is, is there was a forest about, about 40 years ago, nearly 40 years ago, and for 10 years I had a struggle because people were illegally cutting trees and things like that. And then after 10 years, some villagers came to my house and said, we'd like to help you to protect this. So I said, what made you think of that? And he said, well, your path, the, the wells on the your path have water. The wells on the, the other side, which have been uh, quarried and deforested, those wells have dried up. So we think there's some connection. So it is now a community. It's, it's still owned by actually my daughter, <coughs> my daughter's name, because of land reform regulations at the time. But the villagers look after it. And um, it was. We did it without funds. And if they want to do a project, I, I said, look at the forest trees. They don't ask for loans. They don't ask for fertilizer. And yet they become quite mighty in, in due course. So I said, you've got to establish your roots and find these that way. So now, I mean, I do tend to give them a little money, but not that much, because to, em to empower them, uh, you know, it wouldn't have done if I kept telling them what to do. So I did, gave them a free hand, and they, they, they have, there wasn't that much money in the villages. So they were able to, now it's, uh, the, the society is now 30 years old. It has its own uh, committees, the under 12 society, and the 18 society. And so they run it on very little funds. And that, I think, is part of our tradition. Our, our traditional ways were like that. We didn't go around asking for loans and, you know, uh, all that kind of thing. And we know that if we do too much and get too many loans, we can fall into trouble, as has happened to our country. So we had to take some of that old wisdom back as well and try and do what we can do without necessarily depending on uh, too much in the way, you know, not, not do too many fancy projects, which is why we, the country has fallen into trouble, because they're doing very expensive projects, which they cannot afford to pay back. So we have to balance it. I'm not saying this, the old way is right, necessarily in today's context, but we have to balance it too. And on that note, I'm going to say thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to everyone who's asked a question. This is the last physical talk for Kala and Art South Asia project. So I want to take this time to thank everyone, the Lino Wen Art Trust, the whole Kala team, everyone, all the wonderful panelists as well. Thank you so much, and uh, we'll see you soon.